Hi, Robert. Hello, Naomi. How are you? Great. How are you? Fantastic. Nice yeah. <laughs> uh, welcome. Welcome to our webinar. It looks like a bunch of people are rolling in here as we speak. We will give it another 30 seconds here. Okay. I think I think we're good to kick it off. So thanks for taking the time, Naomi, for joining us today. Uh, we are going to talk about the full conversation related to the legalities of a residential. Oh, we got some feedback. Yeah, I'm hoping to keep the information buyers and sellers about what you might selling and buying a home, um, some tips um, to keep them safer in their transactions and keep their transactions smoother. Yeah, fantastic. And I think that's our model, of course. So a, a brief intro about Bode. Um, we do real estate transactions with buyers and sellers connecting directly uh, with our technology, uh, buying and selling homes without an agent and fully modernizing the process in a convenient and empowered way, providing you all the data and all the tools that you need, including contracts. So we'll get into the specific specifics of that. Um, and so this, uh, as I mentioned, this, this call is about understanding how a lawyer can be helpful uh, to buyers and sellers during the transaction. And we have a great expert join us today from Vancouver and focused on the Vancouver and, and BC legalities. Um, so maybe just from the top, Naomi, uh, what are the important factors to identify when hiring a real estate lawyer, would you say? Um, well, it's a tough question. Usually um, the first person people go to are um, the experts that they're working with, realtors and mortgage brokers. I highly doubt that anyone really, many people really Google um, a good real estate lawyer. Um, but uh, the points to uh, to look out for, obviously, uh, for us, we, uh, we work, it's completely word of mouth. So we re really rely on reputation. Um, and we, for that reason, we really try hard to um, keep our standards high. Um, one big question that people have when they're um, choosing um, their uh, representative um, is usually what is the difference between notaries and lawyers? Um, lawyers, well, I, I always sort of um, give the example of buying an insurance policy. When you buy an insurance policy with uh, sort of a um, with more things to um, insure you from, you pay a higher premium as well. Um, with lawyers, lawyers are held to a higher standard. Um, we are obligated to give legal advice, whereas notaries are not really, don't have that obligation. Uh, they're not really supposed to give legal advice outside of their uh, routine work. So we look into um, more than just a realistic transaction that they're doing. We look into their estate. We give them some advice there. Um, if they need a will, if how they um, supposed to sort of when they're acquiring this property or selling this property, how that might affect them, um, their estate going forward as well. Um, I, I always say there are good notaries and there are bad lawyers. So it doesn't just because someone's a lawyer doesn't mean they're better than a notary. But typically, if you're looking at the cost, the good notary charges the same as a good lawyer. So, um, yeah. I hope I'm right I well, that's well said. And you touched on the buyer process and the sell process. Obviously, they're, they have different different uh, aspects to them. Maybe help us and help the audience uh, by walking us through the process on the buy side. And then we can talk about the sell side and how those two processes uh, differ from each other. Sure. Um, well, as far as the dealing goes with us, uh, with our lawyers, we typically get instructed at some point um, either by being contacted uh, or introduced um, from, uh, from a referral. Um, we, at that point, we um, speak with a client, ask them if there's anything that they let, let us know in advance, anything that we want to look out for. 
Um, and um, then we just, uh, based on their instructions, we move forward. We do um, some um, due diligences. Uh, we look at the title of the property, uh, make sure if, if everything's okay, if anything needs to be done. If, uh, for example, if there is a, um, um, the, uh, if there is any uh, so liens on uh, on the uh, property, then we will have to uh, make sure that those are removed. Uh, we also look at taxes of the property because taxes are attached to the property, not to the owner of the property. So we make sure that those taxes will be dealt with on completion. Uh, we, if it's a strata uh, property, we also uh, contact the strata. So we will be um, during the process. We will be in contact with the client um, to obtain some information from them, uh, ask them some questions so that we can sort of uh, um, prepare the documents and better advise them going forward. Also, we are also in contact with the seller's representative, um, making sure that the document that the seller needs to sign. Um, are dealt with properly in, uh, in due time and also if um, the charges that the uh, seller's lawyer needs to remove from the title, often there's a mortgage uh, that we need to make sure the seller's representative uh, removes them. Uh, we just uh, sort of contact, uh, we're in contact with them to let them know. And uh, we're also in contact with the lender. If there is a mortgage, uh, we're in contact with the lender. They send us their instructions and based on those instructions, we prepare the documents. Um, so before um, completion, we will uh, have prepared one important document for the client, which is the buyer statement of adjustments. And uh, that document outlines all the, um, the every uh, sort of the funds that they need to bring in to uh, close the transaction. That includes any property transfer taxes, um, any sort of um, costs such as property taxes that will be prorated between the buyer and the seller. Um, and any um, our fees and disbursements that will all be included. So we'll ask the client to bring, to provide a draft um, and we will set up a time to meet. And when we meet, we go over all the documents, make sure everything's good and make sure the client understands um, uh, what those documents are. And uh, on completion date, uh, which is an important date on the contract, we will file the transfer um, to effectively transfer the title to the buyer's name and we will pay the sales representative and ask the sales representative to from those proceeds to pay out any mortgages and we will be following up with them uh, for the next two to three months to make sure everything's dealt with in, in um, due course quite a few steps yeah there are actually do you find during do most deals look similar in your world from a buy perspective uh, um, or is there how how would you break down the kind of the standard deal versus the crazy deal that ends up with different uh, different nuances that you may or may not expect? Majority of uh, files are um, very standard. Uh, we typically don't have uh, many problems. Uh, we also in our office we have policy that we start um, sort of two to three weeks in advance, um, not too early because we don't want to do our searches too early in, in case anything changes and not too late that uh, we don't have time to deal with something if we if we catch something. So we try to have things uh, done and we try to notify the sales lawyer as early as possible if there are any sort of issues that need time to uh, um, to be dealt with uh, prior to completion. Um, once in a blue moon, there is something that might uh, come up. We've never really had, we've never had a deal that not completed. Uh, because of an issue, anything, if there's a problem, there's a solution for it, for sure. Um, but it's just um, the key is timing that um, if uh, sometimes we get not, uh, hired just a week before completion, we can do it, we will do it for the client, but we just never advise for that short of a time because if anything comes up, um, if we need to get, for example, documents from Estrada, um, and the strata is slow. They're busy, they're slow. That can actually, we've, we've had instances when we had to wait until 5 p.m. on cl a closing date before we can get the documents and then we were uh, able to file and close. So it's, um, it's always important. If timing is right, most problems will have a solution. You guys work through midnight and 24 seven in those cases? 
Um, well, it's been a while since I've done that. I, now I have, I have, we have enough staff, but there was a time when I first started that I, yes, I was working 14, 15 hours a day sometimes. Um, there was one summer when they introduced the, uh, the foreign tax buyer, uh, foreign buyer tax, um, and everyone wanted to close within a week. So we were, it was, it was crazy, but we've ha we haven't had anything like that. We, yeah. That's oh, that's great. That, I think that's really helpful on the buy side to really understand the process. And you touched on timings. What would you, what would you say is the ideal? Obviously, earliest as you know, earliest possible uh, is ideal. But what's kind of the practical timing on the buy side that you would recommend uh, so that you don't run into you have enough flexibility to deal with issues as you uh, described. I would say two to three weeks is a good time for us. We, we don't get started uh, earlier than um, three weeks or a month, uh, because as I said, we want to do our um, due diligence searches uh, not too far away from um, closing date. Um, but I would suggest as early as possible, have a lawyer on your um, team. Um, also just try whenever the, the, uh, the deal is firm. So subjects are removed, there are no conditions left on uh, the contract. That's a good time to um, involve a lawyer. Um, and if, if you're um, doing a, uh, this transaction on your own, then I would say just when you first start, definitely hire a lawyer. When you see the, are most contracts coming to you at, at that point, are you finding that they are there are no conditions in a typical transaction for the deals that you're working on, or are you seeing what what ratio are you seeing of deals with conditions versus not? Uh, well, we uh, uh, we get involved when the uh, subjects are removed. So when there's a realtor involved, we get involved when the subjects are removed. Um, if there uh, if we're um, if there are no realtors, then you're involved earlier uh, than that as well. Um, as for subject free contracts, um, it, it kind of goes up and down. There are periods of time when the market is hotter and everyone wants to sort of have a better offer, um, more attractive offer, and they go subject free. Uh, right now, I see people are a bit more reasonable in that way, and there are subjects, um, and um, yeah, they're not taking chances. So that's for our, for our from our business perspective, that's helpful insight important that you have a lawyer in the mix up earlier if you're buying uh, where you don't have an agent that is normally doing some some aspect of gathering the documentation yes. um, at the end of the day it is the, the lawyer that is the expert and trained on the legalities of the contracts anyways uh, so helpful if you're a buyer to bring in a, a lawyer earlier bring in Naomi and her team earlier so you can have the protection that you need and the insights from a legal perspective that you're taking all the right steps. Yes, absolutely. Um, so maybe shifting to the sell side, uh, walk us through the process there from your perspective. Okay, from uh, with us again, we typically get involved uh, when uh, subjects are removed and the deals firm. So at that point, we are either contacted by the client or introduced through uh, a referral source. Um, Again, we always have an initial consultation. We call the client, speak with them if we haven't, especially if we haven't heard from them, and uh, confirm their instructions and ask them if there's anything they'd like to share with us, if they have any concerns um, before we get started. Then we do, um, we do, we typically look at title search um, just to see what type of charges we need to deal with uh, prior to uh, completion. Um, typically, there are um, mortgages, there might be some other liens, there might be tax deferrals um, that we need to uh, contact the charge holder and ask them to give us a payout statement. Um, so we're also in contact with the uh, buyer's representative and the buyer's representative, they will be preparing some documents um, to affect the transfer. They will send it to us. We will review those uh, documents and um, we will have a statement of, of adjustments uh, for the client, same as with the purchase that will show sort of what the sale uh, price is. And then um, typically commissions get deducted from it. Um, there's some probation for uh, property taxes, strata fees, et cetera. Um, and um, of, um, 
the payout for the mortgage or any other charges that might be on title will be all uh, sort of um, prepared in, in that document and then showing at the end uh, what will be the uh, funds provided to the client after the closing. So we will uh, prepare all that, uh, contact the um, client before completion. Typically meetings happen two to three days before uh, completion date. Uh, that's when everything comes together. And uh, we sign with a client and uh, send documents back to the buyer's representative. And on completion date, uh, we just wait for the buyer's representative to file the transfer to their client. And when they do, they send us uh, sale proceeds. Uh, from those proceeds, we pay out mortgage, pay out any property taxes, anything that needs to be paid out and uh, release um, the excess to the client. And afterwards, we will, for another two to three months, we will be uh, sort of keeping the file open just to make sure um, that charges on title are, are cleared. So um, the, le the lender, the existing charge holders have removed their charges from the title. And that's an interesting, so the, I, I believe that's a nuance between British Columbia and Alberta, that two to three month period, uh, you're confirming there is some lagging in terms of payments that are required after the uh, completion day. Uh, it's just purely administrative. Um, they just have to, they get paid right away, but then usually we're dealing with uh, big banks or they have a queue of um, other files that they they typically get to it within two months. Um, sometimes we have to follow up with them. Sometimes they just, something falls through the cracks and we have to follow up with them, make sure that they, um, they file it. Yeah. That makes sense. And then coming back to the timing question on the sell side, similar principle there, getting getting involved as early as possible through, uh, absolutely. through the transaction, have as much guidance as you can. Yes, absolutely. As early as possible, we say two to three weeks is a good time uh, for us um, to be able to smoothly close a transaction for them. Um, if there's anything that we need to deal with, uh, we don't want any last surprises. We don't want any last surprises. The client doesn't want any last surprises either. Um, so, yeah, it could be done in less time, but we uh, we just definitely recommend two to three weeks at least. Yeah. That makes sense. And and thinking more along the lines of of tips and and helpful insights for our for our audience. Uh, what tips would you recommend during a home transaction process over and above timing? Well, uh, based on our own experiences, I'd say engage with a lawyer as early as possible or other experts that you need uh, for your transaction. Engage with them as early as possible. Um, try to see, um, you know, if, if, if you connect with them well, um, if um, they work the same way that as you do, um, if, if you connect and um, you can continue throughout the transaction with them. Um, for sellers, I would say um, just uh, to be aware to, um, especially if you're doing your own deal, um, to disclose anything um, that you think the buyer should know, even if they don't ask you that question. Disclose it if there's any deficiencies with the property, if there are any sort of issues that you think might um, affect the marketability of the property, disclose, disclose it to the buyer. Um, because that can can come back and haunt you um, in the future. It could be misrepresentation, uh, even even if the buyer doesn't ask. Uh, for uh, for the buyers, I would definitely suggest uh, that if they are claiming, if they are planning on claiming some sort of an exemption, uh, it's usually for property transfer tax, anything like that, to make sure they definitely meet the qualifications, uh, the criteria for those exemptions. Um, it can really uh, sort of complicate the, uh, the the transaction, the closing process. Uh, if, for example, the buyer um, thinks they qualify for first-time home buyer exemption, and then when they, uh, at, you know, two to three weeks before, uh, when they start dealing with us, they realize that they don't. And now they might be short money, um, so they have to go and find more money, and it just it can cause a lot of uh, trouble for them. Um, another thing, another issue that usually uh, comes up uh, is regarding tenanted properties. If there is a tenant, um, just make sure that you're um, speaking with the other side. If, if 
if you're intending to move in um, or if you're intending to do construction in the property that you need to serve notice to the tenant to vacate, that you do that in a timely uh, manner. Um, that, um, that has come up a few times in the past um, few months for us when um, they um, uh, both sides weren't communicating well and the tenant uh, wasn't leaving it on time for the buyers to be able to move in. Uh, that really complicates the, um, the process and the buyer really wants to move in, they're planning on it, They've, they may have given notice to their own for their existing property. Um, also, when there's a tenant involved um, that uh, beware of the any in, in British Columbia, um, there are only certain um, reasons uh, to be able to serve a notice um, to to the uh, tenant. I won't get into the details of that, but in some situations, um, you might sort of have to pay a penalty, uh, a month uh, free rent to the uh, to the tenant. In that case. Um, make sure the contract deals with who pays that penalty. Is it the buyer or is it the seller? So that last minute, um, there aren't any sort of uh, issues um, that you have to deal with. The, the more clear the contract, the better. Um, another thing that I would say for um, the sellers is to make sure they understand um, any payout penalties that they might have to pay for getting out of their existing mortgage uh, before the end of the term. Um, it has come up as a surprise um, last minute when they weren't aware of large penalties that they had to pay. Oh, uh, that's a good list. And maybe touching on one thing you said on the uh, defects from a property perspective, mm -hmm. can you talk about some examples of what would constitute a defect for a seller? Yeah, um, that's not. Uh, completely my area of practice that sort of uh, really comes into a um, contract and litigation um, areas of practice. Um, but I would just, um, I would say anything, I can give you an example, it's kind of an extreme example of what something that had came up um, a few years ago in, in Vancouver, and that was a murder that had took place right in front of the property, and that wasn't disclosed. So later on, um, when the buyer moved in and they found out, they just didn't want to live there and they sued the seller. Um, it was deemed that the seller should have disclosed that information um, to the uh, the buyer. And yeah, I'm just I'm not aware of the details of what went on after and how they sort of had to sort it out. But uh, yeah. He's cleaned up the blood on the carpet and, and took care it's of that. It's just the marketability of it's just the property becomes less attractive. Um, so yeah, it can it can get complicated. Yeah, absolutely. And we you know, from Bo's perspective, we've designed in all these different nuances that that can show up. So material laden defects, uh, there's a form you you need to as you describe, you need to, to sign and confirm if there is additional mm -hmm. title holders. Um, powers of attorney that can come into play if you're representing uh, the seller through a trust or through some other uh, situation. So we've we've designed in each of these agreements in a, in a really standard, simple way as part of our listing agreement, so that every one of our customers has ease of access and and full understanding of what's required there. And then the great thing is if they have have engaged you early, as we've talked about, then any questions on that front. Uh, they can reach out and from our perspective uh, our team can be supportive there on some of the simpler issues as well uh, but important to have have empowered our customers with all those those pieces of information so they know exactly what they're obligated to do and they're covered from a legal standpoint yes absolutely um great so we have uh we have some questions from the audience here you guys yeah one of the questions is um for negotiating does a lawyer help with negotiating those terms in terms of uh so the question is in negotiations can a lawyer be helpful uh during the negotiation of terms and through the negotiation process that's a good question that really sort of um it's a very tricky um question as well uh, typically, because we get uh, involved after subjects are removed and the contract is firm, 
at that point, we do not want to negotiate the contract because if we do start negotiating uh, negotiations regarding the contract, um, it can actually alert the seller uh, and give them a sort of a, um, a position to walk out from the deal because they might say it's called an anticipatory breach. So they might say that, um, well, if you're negotiating this, you don't want to complete the contract as we have it and it's firm. And I'm just going to walk out. I'm, I'm just going to assume that you will not close this contract and I'm going to walk out. And if they have a better buyer out there, then that's a good sort of chance for them to to walk out and move. So we, um, when the contract is firm, subjects are removed. We don't get involved in um, negotiating the contract. Um, I know um, there are some. Uh, it, it is possible um, to do so also. And not every sort of negotiation. If you go back to the um, um, seller and ask them, hey. Um, could you let me in for just one inspection? It's not included in our contract, but I just want to do the, uh, this inspection. Um, it doesn't necessarily give the seller to, the right to walk away um, because it doesn't really provide that reason for them to think that the buyer is not going to complete if they don't give them that access. Um, so it's not always, it's a sort of a, um, um, it's not a very black and white area, so we just we uh, stay away from negotiating the contract. However, um, prior to um, a contract becoming firm, firm, if we have, um, if we are, um, for example, drafting the contract, we do negotiate with the other side. We, we don't have a contract. There's no. Uh, we're just sort of negotiating the terms to go into the contract. Um, we we do sort of advise our client on um, what terms are best for them to take and then sort of um, present it to the other side. If, if I'm, for example, acting for the buyer, I will draft a contract based on the instructions from our client and what I think is the uh, in the best interest of my client, because that's what I'm supposed to do. It's I'm supposed to look after the best interest of my client. Um, I will then present it to the other side and they will sort of, they will probably do the same if they're dealing with a, um, if it's a lawyer on the other side, they will do the same. And we will um, from there. We will just negotiate until we uh, both parties are are happy uh, with the terms. Um, but yeah, that's a tricky one because after the, the deal is firm, you don't want to really open the contract that way. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, and you're even if you're not driving the trend, if you, even if you're not driving the negotiation, or I would say lawyer to lawyer between a buyer and seller. You are still available to advise your client if they have questions on yes, of course. absolutely uh, buyer sell perspective on what's normal. You know these term values of these terms versus values of those terms, and just really understanding the legal balance of the discussion. Correct. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. We um, the majority of our clients right now are. Um, we have some sort of private deals, uh, but majority are with realtors. And usually, we do get in, um, contacted by the realtors uh, quite often, asking if we can help uh, with uh, drafting a term, um, sort of revising something in the contract. Is usually they know that both parties are um, okay with it, and we're happy to do it. Uh, we we actually, I personally prefer being involved in that process um, because I want to make sure it's done properly and it's not going to um, cause any issues uh, for us closing. So um, yeah, definitely would uh, would be able to help. <clears throat> and in Bode's case, we have, we have built into our offer negotiation process standard terms. Um, so I'm guessing those you kind of where you guys, where lawyers can really help is some more unique circumstances where the language needs to be really precise. Uh, of course, an agent isn't going to be good at, at drafting up that legal language. They're not lawyers. Um, so the ability for for it to be done correctly and succinctly. Yes. Is Absolutely. Great. Especially when it comes to holdbacks, because um, a lot of time um, after the, uh, the deal is firm, but before completion, uh, some deficiency issue comes up, and then the both uh, two parties, um, if uh, they're being amicable about it, they sort of have uh, a hold back uh, clause so that we hold back a, a certain amount of money uh, until that the issue is the deficiencies are um, corrected. 
Um, so for those holdbacks, because it's just um, it's very uh, tricky um, for us to be able to uh, um, to rely on it, it has to it cannot be vague. It has to be very clear on uh, who holds back the money, for how how much of the money, how long, uh, what are the conditions for it, for it to be released, etc. Uh, so we I, I always just prefer to do it myself, and so that I know what I'm dealing with. Yeah. And speaking of money, uh, another question we have here is typical costs uh, for your services on the buy and sell side. Um, well, the typical cost, I would say, um, if I'm thinking about property that is under a million uh, value, uh, mortgage is also registered for under a million. Sometimes lenders register a higher value than the actual um, value of the property just because of, it's a collateral mortgage. Um, it will be around um, 1500 to 1700 um on a typical, I can't really sort of, it, it can go up or down. Uh, it really uh, depends on that particular file. Um, it varies from file to file, for, that's for a purchase. Um, for um, for a sale, typically around um, 1200 um, to 1300 would be uh, cost and fees involved, yes. That's helpful. And then, uh, maybe just shifting into another question here. Are there parts of the contract or paperwork process of transitioning title that are more important than others? Are there some something you would highlight to really make sure you pay attention to as a buyer or seller? So the, all of the contract is important. Um, what I would sort of um, be careful with is the, uh, for, for a BC contract, uh, the residency uh, for, especially for the seller, the residency is clear. Uh, we've had, I mean, um, none of the examples I give uh, are very common. They're all sort of anecdotal in a way, uh, but we've had to deal with issue where um, the seller hadn't selected the correct residency for whether or not they're a resident of Canada or not. And last minute things had to change and it was just got really complicated and um, for us acting for uh, the buyer, we didn't know whether we should just uh, accept um, that the seller's residency all, all of a sudden changed um, or not. So um, that is a one uh, for us, for me looking, I always um, pay close attention to the residency for the seller um, because we have to hold back money to pay the taxes um, if that's the case. 25% uh, uh, of the sale price needs to be held back. Uh, if they're not resident of Canada. Um, also, uh, just paying attention is um, to the description of the property that it's um, listed correctly. I've had caught a few uh, instances where the wrong um, address or postal code or something like that was a sort of uh, placed in there. Um, apart from that, uh, the contracts are typically very, uh, it's very standard. Um, it really be, it, and it becomes, it's very unique to every, um, certain uh, terms of it are very unique to every situation also. So I can't say I, I, I always look for a certain clause, um, but if, if there is any sort of, um, I'd say, um, deficiencies for which um, money needs to be held back, it's very important um, that those are drafted properly as we spoke about it earlier as well. We touched on that. Uh, if there are tenants in the property, it's definitely important that it be disclosed in the contract. Uh, we need the information um, for uh, if the tenant is staying, uh, especially, we need the, uh, that information uh, to be able to uh, prepare our documents uh, properly. And that makes sense. Uh, absolutely. Uh, just going down my list more here. One more on the uh, money laundering challenges that have been happening in Vancouver over the last 10 years, how does a lawyer help or do they help in protecting buyers or sellers against those those uh, circumstances or fraudulent attempts? Yeah, well, we have certain um, rules that we have to follow uh, with regards to money laundering. We have to collect some information every time we receive money from any individual. Um, we have to ask for the source of those funds. We can't really, we don't have the um, 
tools or the power to really verify that information, but we have to inquire into it. And if we're suspicious, we need to report it. Um, we also can only collect um, uh, certified funds, so bank drafts and certified checks, um, unless it's uh, less than $7,500 that we can take cash. Our firm, we don't take cash at all. We don't want to deal with cash. Um, it's just an extra sort of responsibility that we don't want to take. Um, so, yeah, um, in those, we, the rules that we have, uh, we have to follow um, to verify identity uh, of the client and to verify, sort of ask them, inquire about the source of the funds, of where it comes from. Um, yeah. So no suitcases full of cash to buy? No, unfortunately, no. <laughs> That makes sense. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, just some clarification on the efficiencies. Uh, for instance, if you're in a multi-story condo and you have a flood from the above unit for like a toilet flood um, and it's fixed and repaired, is it still considered a deficiency as you described it earlier or is it a reoccurring issue? Sorry, you have to repeat that because I couldn't understand it. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, when if a flood happens above you in a multi-apartment complex uh, and ends up in your apartment, do you have to disclose that deficiency? What happens there from a deficiency standpoint? If it wasn't your fault, it was actually the fault of the condo uh, uh, of you or the association. Well, um, if that was sort of before you enter the contract, um, then you probably want to disclose that, yes. I've had actually an uh, instance um, that was just a few months ago that two apartment buildings in uh, Vancouver got flooded um, the same way. One of them was a fish tank that they forgot to uh, close the tab on and it just started running and it flooded into the, uh, the level below. And that was just before um, the sale completed, uh, was going to complete. Um, well, luckily for that one, um, they dealt with the uh, the insurance. Uh, they had, there was insurance and the insurance covered all the costs and um, the uh, it could all be rectified before move-in date and before the pos possession date. Uh, but if, if it's, there are damages uh, from that flood that hasn't been um, sort of dealt with, definitely would say, and you're aware of the flood that it happened, you're aware of those damages, um, you have a uh, an offer uh, subject free with no um, inspection being uh, done. Then you you I would say you have to um, disclose that information. If you know of it, you you definitely have to disclose that information. To clarify, that's been remediated, so it's been repaired, and it's not a recurring issue, it doesn't have to be disclosed. If it's been remediated uh, and repaired, and it's not a recurring issue, would it still need to be disclosed in that same circumstance? Um, well, I would uh, if there are no issues, then there's, there's no issue for not disclosing it either. Uh, I think for, for BC, there is a, um, there's a standard um, property disclosure statement. And that question might come up in there um, if they're aware of anything. Uh, but um, uh, if if there are no if, if if everything's been dealt with, then there's no reason to want to hide it either. Um, if you're asked, um, you definitely need to give the right um, answer because that can um, absolutely be misrepresentation. Um, and then that also gives the um, uh, the potential buyer um, the opportunity to have inspection of their own done. Um, so that they're sure that there are no issues that they need to deal with going forward. Yeah. And that and that will typically ebb and flow in terms of, as you referenced earlier, how hot the market is. If the market's really hot, there's exactly yeah. It's, and when it's when it's cooled off a little bit, then there's more more room for discretion or more uh, additional diligence you can say from a buyer perspective absolutely yes it's which uh, we like that better <laughs> we like it when our clients when they're closing the transaction they're less worried about things and they're just sort of they're not struggling to find financing last minute uh, because they just sort of they were pushed into having um, a subject free offer and, and in in alberta just to contrast that the vast majority of our deals here have we call them conditions 
you call them subjects in BC. Uh, the vast majority in, I would say over the last five years or the two years we've been in business have, have conditions and a lot of the vast majority are also subject to inspections uh, for that very reason to make sure that you're you're getting getting a full view of what's actually going on you know behind the quick walkthrough that many of us do when we're buying a home so um, that's helpful um related to that question in a condo building do you need to disclose only information related to your unit that's deficiency or related to the entire building um, would this be part of your condo documents so so similar to the last situation if there's a condo outside that's that's in your same building and had an issue um, do you need to disclose that or is it only your specific condo well, if it's effect, well if your unit 801 and it's 1208 that's having an issue i don't really see why that will have uh, an impact on your uh, unit if it's next door um some issue that you're aware of and you think that that might have some impact into your your property then i would say um disclose it um to the buyer um if it's an information that you think the buyer ought to know um definitely disclose it um if let the buyer do their own due diligence and be sure whether or not they want to proceed based on the information that you provided them and that will um sort of uh, keep you safe from liability in the future Makes sense. As a seller, what obligation does the buyer have to disclose their suitability, suitability or eligibility to purchase? As a seller? Or so, as a seller, what obligation does the buyer have to disclose to the seller of their eligibility to purchase? As a seller, what obligation does the buyer have in order to? Uh, prove their eligibility to purchase the property? Um, I don't think they have to prove their eligibility for purchasing the property to the seller, but they the buyer has to complete or they will be in default uh, in breach of their uh, the contract and responsible or liable to, to the seller. Um, I don't think this, the buyer has to disclose if they have the money in their, in their um, sort of bank account sitting or um, to, to show them proof that they qualify for mortgage. Uh, but I do see often in um, contracts in BC um, that the, um, there's a term that says, for example, the buyer is aware of, uh, that they have to pay property transfer tax, which is 1% of the first 200,000, 2% of the rest. So so that you know later on, the buyer doesn't have any sort of um, claim that oh, I wasn't aware and I'm short money, not that that would have actually been an excuse really for if we're breaching the contract, uh, but they could just do the floor to make it tighter and sort of you know, more clear to both sides of, of their obligations and um, to making sure that they are aware of what they need to do. I see that um, a lot of uh, realtors put that um, in uh, clause into the contract that they Another clause that I see often is um, GST. Um, so this it has the, the buyer or the seller. Both parties are um, obligated to get their own um, advice regarding GST. So that sort of um, it's it's sort of a kind of a, a reminder for for both parties that if they have to look into that issue, they need to do it right now. Which I uh, it's good for. I I do like those clauses actually in there. Um, but yeah. That extra bit of extra bit of protection and clarity. Yeah. Any final questions? Naomi is a wealth of knowledge here. It's been really, really helpful. A lot of different, a lot of important insights for for people in this process, I think. Sounds like that's uh, that's the list. Is there anything else that you need? We might have one more question. Uh, in the meantime, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, touch on that we haven't had the opportunity to talk about yet? You know, we went through everything that I had. Like I had a list uh, done yesterday, things that I want to talk about, and we went through all of them, actually. So it, it was very good flow of conversation. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and enjoy it thoroughly as well.
Um, somebody, so, sounds like we have one final question coming yes. in hot here, or maybe warm. This is not it. <laughs> Maybe one other one other question that I had while that's coming in is um, obviously you're dealing with agents a lot and you're dealing with uh, individual buyers and some and sellers in some cases. You maybe break down break that down a little more in terms of how you would we touched earlier about the the time being proactive and, and having more time and bringing lawyers in earlier if you don't have an agent. Are there any other aspects that you would touch on that uh, you should consider if you don't have an agent? Um, well, if you don't have the agent, well, you definitely need help with, uh, I would say, uh, with uh, drafting the contract. I uh, do not recommend, it's not just for me to get business, but I do not recommend doing it yourself. Um, it, it's, it won't cost that much uh, for uh, for consulting with a lawyer and to make sure that um, it's done properly with the proper causes placed in the uh, in the contract. Uh, one thing that uh, when I get contacted by um, private sellers or buyers asking for us to draft a contract, one thing that I cannot advise them on is whether it's a good deal. Um, if they're selling it for the right price or if they're selling it for of the buying it uh, if it's too much or too low that is not something that i can advise them on because that's not my expertise so i definitely recommend to them that they do their own due diligence and they look at um comparable listings or um sold properties um out there i, I believe there are um tools for doing that for for individuals um that they do their own due diligence with regards to the uh, market price of the property and whether or not this is something neighborhood something they want to, to live in i will obviously have not looked at the property um to be able to tell you if, if there's something that you need to watch out for if there's a um the roof lo looks funny or if the floors need to change that those are things that they need to um do themselves or have an expert take an expert with them and do their own due diligence that way and once they're ready to draft the contract, we are um, here to help. Um, but they have to sort of do a lot of due diligence themselves as well. Yeah, and, and the way our model works, we have we do have inspectors, we have appraisers, we have all the market data tools available to you as a buyer to do that diligence all online at your convenience. And then we have built in this offer flow where you're able to Bill to create the terms and the pricing and deposits and attached and unattached goods and timing and deposit amounts and the typical terms of a transaction and some other some other terms that are uh, more specific uh, to the specific property. So we we do have that option for our buyers. They can if they've done this before or they're confident based on the research they've done or they've already spoken to a lawyer. They can go through that process. Um, it is still a a standard agreement that you guys would be helping them populate, correct? Like you're still working off the same license agreement in BC, the typical British Columbian uh, residential transaction agreement uh, that we would have as well, correct? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Makes sense. So as a seller, if you've already given your lawyer your mortgage number, do you need to advise them of any early buyout penalties or will the lawyer find that out If you, Okay. If you've already given the mortgage number to the lawyer, is that something they need to find out themselves? Do they need to find out about any early buyout penalties or do you need to give that information to your lawyer? Do you, so from a mortgage perspective, do you need to find out if there are bio penalties yourself or is that the information provided to you by the lawyer um for this is for us acting for a seller correct or doing yes. a refinance and we have to pay out the mortgage uh well we contact the uh um lender and we ask them for a statement so we typically will ask the client uh, when we look at the title search and we see there is a mortgage we uh, contact the client ask them for a mortgage number if we need that and then we will contact the lender and we will ask them to send us a payout statement. 
um, the payout statement will outline what the penalties will be. Um, so we'll outline just exactly what the principal that needs to be repaid, uh, repaid any penalties that need to be repaired, uh, uh, repaid and um, interest up to the date that we're uh, paying it back. Um, however, at that point, if, um, if the seller does not know about a penalty, at that point, it might catch them a surprise. Um, so it's, they are able to, ahead of time, before selling the property, they're able to contact the bank and ask them uh, what penalties they have to pay. Um, and uh, that way, they just sort of make the decision to sell based on that information as well. Um, sometimes, especially if it's a private um, mortgage or if it's a uh, some kind of a sort of um, variable rate, uh, sorry, a, a fixed rate mortgage, then they can end up with hefty penalties for walking out, walking away from uh, the mortgage midterm. Um, so it's good for them to know um, and make an informed decision um, when they want to sell the property. Again, makes sense, and that's that's very helpful insight. So I think we'll uh, I think we'll wrap it up here. An absolute delight to speak with you, Naomi, and thank you again yes. for thank you again for all the the thoughts and and insights. I know this is very helpful to the people, long list of people on the call right now, and and to those that will watch the recording of this. So thank you again. Have a great day, and hope to see you well. again soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.